Greetings, my wonderful students. Today we discuss the constitutional powers of Congress. Constitutional provisions. The elastic clause allows Congress to do what is necessary and proper to carry out its enumerated powers. The Supreme Court has often had to decide in disputes over what is necessary and proper. Dispute over whether Congress could create the Second Bank of the United States. This dispute led to the court case McCulloch v. Maryland. Some powers are denied to Congress. The Bill of Rights limits laws that Congress can pass. Article 1, Section 9 also denies certain powers to Congress. Congress cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Congress cannot pass a bill of attainder, which basically says someone is guilty of something, uh, not with an investigation, but because Congress had passed it. And Congress cannot pass ex post facto laws, laws after the fact, basically saying that, uh, let's say you did something that was legal today, then Congress passed a law against it tomorrow, and then so someone arrested you tomorrow for breaking the law today. But what you did was legal when you did it. Congress can't do that. Legislative powers, taxing and spending power. No federal government agency may spend money unless authorized by Congress. This is known as Congress as having the power of the purse. Article 1, Section 7 says all bills for raising revenue must originate in the House of Representatives, which is why many times we have to wait for a specific bill to begin in the House of Representatives, not in the Senate. Appropriations bills, however, are not limited in this way. Article 1, Section 9 states that money can only be drawn from the Treasury through appropriations made by law. Congress has used its power over money to extend its regulatory power. Money given to the states usually has requirements the states, states must follow if they wish to receive the funds. Congress may use taxes and spending to discourage or encourage certain industries or even stimulate the economy. Other money powers. Article 1 also grants Congress the authority to borrow money. This is done through the sale of savings bonds, treasury bills, and treasury notes. When someone buys any of these, they are effectively lending the government money. The government promises to repay these loans with interest when the bonds, etc., mature. Borrowing money has created a national debt. The Constitution does not limit the national debt, but Congress passed a law in 1917 to set a debt ceiling, to say that the debt can only go up to a certain amount and, can't, and cannot go any higher. The ceiling, however, has been raised over and over again to allow the government to borrow more money to pay its bills. The Constitution gives Congress the power to coin and regulate money and to punish counterfeiters. Congress also has the authority to make bankruptcy laws. The Commerce Power The Constitution gives Congress the authority to regulate interstate commerce and commerce within foreign nations. Uh, this has greatly increased federal power due to interpretations of what commerce is. Gibbons versus Ogden. New York State had granted an exclusive right to operate steamboats on New York waters to Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston. Now this monopoly granted Aaron Ogden a permit for the steamboat travel across the Hudson between New York, New York and New Jersey. Thomas Gibbons had a competing line and operated using a coastal, coasting license from the federal government. Ogden sued Gibbons and it was appealed to the Supreme Court because Ogden had this permit which they believed was a monopoly. But Gibbons had a competing line using federal, uh, uh, federal licensing. Ogden's side argued that federal regulation did not apply because commerce involved products. The court ruled that all forms of business, not just products moving across state lines, fell under the Commerce Clause. The definition of commerce has expanded to allow Congress to regulate banking, broadcasting, pollution, minimum wage, and other numerous parts of daily life. The Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States. In 1964, Congress used the Commerce Clause to justify its passage of the Civil Rights Act. A Georgia motel owner sued, stating that a motel was local and not subject to the Interstate Commerce Clause, commerce between the states. 
However, the Supreme Court ruled that these institutions, motels, served interstate travelers, travelers between the states, and therefore were subject to federal regulation. Foreign Policy Powers Congress and the President share foreign policy and national defense powers. Congress has allowed the President to lead in this area for the most part. Congress has not formally declared war since 1942. But United States forces have been involved in numerous conflicts since then. In 1973, Congress passed the War Powers Act over a presidential veto. That forbids the president from committing U.S. forces to combat for more than 60 days without notifying Congress within 48 hours. Providing for the nation's growth. The Constitution grants Congress power over naturalization, the process of becoming a citizen. The Constitution also allows Congress to govern territories and to admit new states to the Union, the Union of States, the United States. Congress also has the power to pass laws to govern federal property. And in the beginning, this meant federal buildings and military bases. Now, however, this includes national parks, historic sites, and millions of acres of public lands. Other legislative powers. Congress has the power to grant copyrights and patents under the Constitution. Congress also has the power to establish a postal service and federal courts. Congress has used its postal power to make the use of mail for an illegal act a federal crime. And non-legislative powers. The power to choose a president. Yes, Congress counts uh, the electoral votes for the president. And if no candidate has a majority of electoral votes, then the House of Representatives chooses the president and the Senate chooses the vice president. The 20th and 25th Amendments give Congress the power to deal with issues rising from the death of elected candidates and the presidential incapacity or the resignation of a president. Removal power. Congress can remove any federal official from office through impeachment. Now, the House of Representatives would hold a vote for articles of impeachment. The Senate would then act as a jury if the articles of impeachment pass the House. If an impeachment involves a president, then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court presides over the trial. Impeachment proceedings have happened several times since the adoption of the Constitution, but only three presidents have been impeached. President Andrew Johnson, who survived impeachment by just one vote. Uh, president Clinton, who was impeached for perjury and obstruction of justice and was acquitted. And President Trump, who was impeached for abuse of power and obstruction of Congress and was acquitted confirmation of power. The Senate has the power to approve presidential appointments. Most appointments are the promotions of military officers and are just a formality. Cabinet and sub-cabinet positions, diplomatic posts, regulatory agencies, and numerous judges, however, bring more scrutiny before approval. Ratification power. The Senate has the power to ratify treaties between the U.S. and other nations. For a treaty be, to be ratified, two-thirds of the senators present must vote for it. The presidents of recent years have begun using executive agreements which do not require Senate ratification in, a, in order to bypass the Senate. The amendment power. Congress has the power to propose constitutional amendments by a two-thirds vote by both houses. A proposed amendment must, of course, be ratified by three-quarters of the states in order to go into effect. Congress has the power to choose whether state ratifications will be done by state legislatures or special ratifying conventions in each state. And this is our uh, end of our lecture on congressional powers.